Well, that, God determines that. But if we use the talents that God gives to us, we will be successful, we will be rewarded. And this morning you are using the talent that you have. It's called an awareness of the sacredness of life. And others depend upon your use of this talent of bringing to the world the message of life. You know, it's been a very interesting week in terms of the church's year of grace. Uh, yesterday we, we celebrate the feast of the beheading of John the Baptist. And uh, he, he gave witness to the truth even to the point of uh, giving up his life. What an example to us of giving witness to the truth no matter what it cost. And the day before we had the, the feast of St. Augustine. And, and St. Augustine um, wrote a book called The City of God, The City of Man. And the times were very, very difficult. And things were falling apart. The barbarians were overrunning the empire and uh, they were blaming the Christians for it. The Christians with their turn the other cheek be forgiving and merciful. They, they said they made us weak. And so there was, there was the beginning of a persecution of the Christians at that time. And so uh, they went to the Bishop of Hippo, Bishop Augustine, and they asked him if he would write something to defend, to defend the Christians that they're not the cause of the downfall of the empire. He wrote the book, The City of God. And in it, he, he began to, to see that there, there is, a, 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 within each of us, a, a battle between goodness and, and righteousness and evil. And those who um, uh, are establishing a, a city of God does it on the basis of goodness, goodness itself. And they are the ones really who are the ultimate savior of society. And today, we are experienced throughout the world a similar experience. Uh, people say, what's happening? Everything's falling apart. Well, John Paul II described it well. He said, if you do not follow the wisdom of God, you will have a culture of death. And a culture of death is really spreading throughout the world. I mean, uh, not just the children themselves, uh, and, but uh, human beings being beheaded. And people are shocked, being, being shocked. And, you know, next week we will celebrate what they call 9-11. And 9-11 was when the Twin Towers were taken down by an act of a terrorist. And um, the, the, the act of the, of the terrorist um, um, was something that so shocked the world, the, the disrespect for life. And yet what we are experiencing now, uh, that's child's play in comparison to what has happened to us, just in terms of perspective. Next year, Pope Francis is coming to the United States. He's coming to join in a, a, a meeting which is for family, for family starting in Philadelphia and hopefully be coming here to New York. But, you know, he was, who was the first pope to come to America? Actually, it was Pope Paul VI. And next year will be the 50th anniversary of the coming of Paul VI. 50 years ago, I remember it well. I was there. And 50 years ago, he came to speak to the United Nations. And he spoke to the United Nations about peace. It's amazing, asking for peace in the world. Same, same, same theme. And um, he, he, his famous line was, war, war, never again, never again. It's 50 years later, it's again and again and again. And, and one of the things he, he, he was applauded all the time he got in the morning to the time he left at, uh, uh, almost to the time he left at night, not quite. Because at that United Nations Assembly Hall and meeting, he spoke, and the first two thirds of the talk, he spoke about war never again, constant applause, constant applause. And suddenly, the last third of that talk, he shocked the world. He shocked the world and he said, uh, in this assembly where all the nations are now gathered, and he's speaking to all the members of the world, he said, in this assembly, most especially, respect for life 
must be a primary thing and something you protect and, and, and respect for life. And he said, and do not eliminate people from coming to the table of life by contracepting them out of existence. Now he said that, you see, that was on October 4th, 1965. Because actually on June 7th, 1965, um, we first legalized the allowing of a contraceptive in America. It was against the law. The pill was not allowed. It was a Griswold versus Connecticut. It was a Supreme Court decision on June 7th that allowed a woman called Griswold, a nurse, to distribute the abortion pill for the first time, for the first time in this country, um, to a, a married couple to be used in the privacy of their home only. And then it began, and the breakdown began. And so uh, that was 1965. In 68, uh, the Holy Father uh, came out with the Mani Vitae, in which he, s he defended family. And he said, family is the only place where life should be conceived. And, 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 and the, 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 the two things which God has created, he wants family to come as a result of an act of human love, of a man and a woman, a man and a woman, in the context of marriage, and then God will work with them uh, and create the soul. And you must not separate that act of love from uh, God's act of creation. And he stressed that clearly. He said, if you do, I tell you this, I tell you this, these things will happen in the world. And if you, if you read section um, 17 in Humani Vitae, it is descriptive of the present time because we separated it. We did not allow it to happen. And uh, the Holy Father said, if you break down this, you will destroy family. You make the purpose of love and, and sexuality, you make the purpose, see the purpose of sexuality says, is it's to bring about out of, out of your act of love, life. It's in this act that you, you work so closely with God, the creator or the procreator who creates the soul of the child. And you must not deliberately shut out life in God's act of creation. If you do so, if you do so, these things will happen to you. Read it. Section 17, Mani Vitae, 1968. Absolutely descriptive of what's happening in the world today because we separated it. And once you separated that act of, of love from life, you had no basis at all to argue against homosexuality. On what basis? You don't like it? No, if you say there's a design and a plan and a purpose, and you must, not, you must respect that, and marriage is God's creation, and ma God made us male and female, and out of this act of love comes life, and the only context in which children should be conceived and cared for is in a family where there's a man and a woman, a father and a mother, and all the rest is nonsense. It's unfair. And once we started to separate that, then suddenly we separated it and in 1970, 1970, in New York State, 44 years ago, we legalized the most liberal abortion law in the world at that time. We said, you can kill the child in the womb up until the seventh month, 1970. And we said that before Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court decision. So even if Roe v. Wade was overturned tomorrow, it doesn't affect us. The law still is in New York State. You can kill the child up to the seventh month. Right? And then it began. And then it began. And so once, once we, we started with the uh, allowing the child to be, to be killed and separating the act of love uh, uh, from life, and then we opened the door. We opened the door. To what? We opened the door to all types of bizarre things in which now we, uh, once we separate that act of human love and sexuality from life, well then technology helped us to do that. All types of contraceptives, all types, all types. But then suddenly they said, well, you separated the act of sexuality from life and from love. Now we're going to have life without human love and sexuality. What? It's called in vitro fertilization. It's in the fertility labs. And today in the fertility labs around the world, it is a 
crying out to God that this is evil what we're doing. In the fertility labs today, no child conceived in the Petri dish is placed in the womb of the mother unless it passes the test. A test? Yes, a test. A genetic test is given to every life. If you fail the test, if you fail the test, you are destroyed. In, in England, for example, if you were to take a, a genetically defective child and put it in the womb of the mother, you are put in jail. It's the practice all over the world. And so we are, we are involved in a massive eugenic cleansing of the human race being done in the fertility labs in the pretext of we want Louisa Brown to be born. Yes, there has been 10 million Louisa Browns born now. That's nothing. How many millions and millions have been destroyed and with the master race is being taken place? We make Adolf Hitler look like child's play. God's truth. And now we're growing life, experimenting on life, destroying life in the laboratories. No one cares. No one sees it. Out of sight, out of mind. And so what has happened is we can't have... And people say, do you see that man was beheaded? My God, what, what kind of people are we? Well, my dear friends, how do you think they get the child out of the womb when they abort the child? They take off the head. What's the difference? It, it is, I remember in, in, in 2001, uh, I was outside the clinic at that time when the planes crashed into the Twin Towers. And um, later I went midnight over to Ground Zero. I remember standing there and I'm looking at the thing and we say, How, what is this about? This act, of these two planes, a terrorist flying into a building, causing great destruction. What in the name of God could they have done that? And while I was there at Ground Zero at midnight, it's like yesterday, while I was there, because in the morning I couldn't go because uh, they were killing the babies at the abortion clinics and everything stopped in New York City on September the 11th. 2001. Everything except what? The killing of the babies. The abortion mills did not close. I was there. I can witness to that. And it was at grounds here in midnight that I was there. And while I was there, I closed my eyes and I could see the two planes crashing into the buildings and the people feeling so secure and so safe inside. And suddenly they, they lost all the security. With this act. And suddenly I didn't see the planes and the terrorists going into the building. At ground zero, I stood there with my eyes closed and I saw a child in a womb. I saw a child in a womb. And the child was so secure, so safe, like the people in the office preparing to get their coffee and their, uh, the drinks in the morning before starting work. And suddenly into that womb, while my eyes were closed, I saw the instrument of the terrorist. It was the instrument of the abortionist breaking into the womb and the child had nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. And then I realized, my God, ground zero is ongoing. Ground zero is wherever this has taken place, like in Jamaica Hospital, Monday through Friday. Like in so many hospitals, so many places. Is anyone there where volunteers go, whoever wants to go to ground zero? Ground zero is here, not far from where any of us live. It's an act of terrorist where the innocent unborn children you know, uh, have nowhere to hide, nowhere to go. And the act of the terrorist comes in upon them. Who is going to help them? Who's going to be heroes? Well, 9-11 was ordinary people. Ordinary people, firemen, officers gave their lives. And all of a sudden we realize the hero is not Hollywood, the hero is not ball players. It's ordinary people being faithful with the talents God gave to them whether it be one or twenty, and being faithful to help and reach out and give witness to the truth. And today, we go to ground zero again. We'll go to the building which during the week, we'll point out during the week, the children are inside like they were in the building. And the terrorists will be during the week coming after them. But this time, we will pray to God, hearts will be changed, people will know it and everything we brought back to normality. You see, we are in the middle of a culture of death, no question. What has happened, we have destroyed family life. We teach the young people homosexuality is normal, separating the act of love from sexuality and life and creation. 
to, to everything we destroy. What kind of a culture are we given to, to our young people? A very destructive, confusing culture. Well, we stand to say, no, life is sacred. Marriage is God's creation. The child held in the womb should be held with great respect. I mean, just recently a man took his life, an actor, Williams. Everybody is weeping. How could he do such a thing? Doesn't he realize life is sacred, life is precious? Well, they're all saying the right thing, except it's insane. Why is it insane? Because we have legalized in the United States and throughout the world euthanasia. Euthanasia is you have a right to take your own life, or have someone to assist in taking your life. State after state after state after state. And we're applauding and we're funding it and we're screaming for it. And then suddenly we say, the man is crazy for taking his life. No, he's a hero. He's following what we're doing. Don't you see we're schizophrenic society? Don't you see the contradiction? Don't you see the absurdity? We, we have become blind. We don't understand. How can you be upset with Williams taking his life when you are legalized and they're taking the life of the, un, of the unborn children, taking the life of the Down syndrome children, taking the life of grandma in, this, in the hospitals? And they're doing it now. They're doing it now. In, in just in France, the same day, the same week, there was a trial. A man came forward and said, I killed nine people, seven people, without the, without the, per, per, the consent of the family, without the consent of the patient. I did it because it was the best thing to do. He was guilty, of course, but the jury came in and they found him innocent. And the whole courtroom in France, in Paris, just recently, they stood and applauded, applauded. Yes, this is the age of euthanasia. You should be able to take your life. Well, then why are you screaming about Williams? It's absurd, isn't it? It's absurd. And so this morning, we go and we witness against this incredible, irrational culture of death. And we bring to it the wisdom of the gospel, the rationality, and true, good, holy people using their talents and gifts to give witness at ongoing ground zero, which is not far from where anyone lives. And for us, it's not far from here. It's called the building out in which abortions take place in Jamaica Hospital. And we'll go there this morning and we will pray and we'll witness and come back and finally ask God to bless what we did with our little talents.